Hello. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, attending our Your Way Together um, Your Way Together web uh, webinar series. Uh, so, for those who are uh, new to Cooperative First, we are a business development organization creating to bring awareness of. Uh, the cooperative model to rural and indigenous communities throughout Western Canada. Today, I am uh, located in Saskatoon in the Treaty 6 territory. So we're, our, our office is not far from the Wanuskewin Heritage Park that has actually been a meeting place for people across uh, the Northern Plains for more than 6,000 years. And we are the homeland to the Métis. My name is Trista Piwapaskirias, uh, Director of Indigenous Relations. And uh, I also have my colleague, Riley, uh, colleague in from Prince Albert uh, today. Uh, so in my role, I work directly with Indigenous communities, uh, groups, and individuals who are looking to start cooperative businesses uh, in their community. So the co-op structure is not a new concept in Indigenous communities and has been used for thousands of years and continue to be so, uh, such, such as uh, an elders co-op that was established to pre preserve the Anishinaabeg language and culture, to the River Select uh, Fisherman's Co-op that eight individual uh, communities work together uh, to market their ethically sourced fish globally to numerous like art co-ops. So today I'm happy to hear from the Udnau Urban Indigenous Consulting Cooperative. Uh, the Udnau Urban Indigenous Consulting Co Cooperative is a talented team of Indigenous people and one settler ally from across Turtle Island. They offer a range of services, including curriculum and workshop development, uh, policy development, community-based research and engagement, indigenous engagement and training, and more. Udna works uh, with clients to identify how their unique skills can I unite and make their community stronger and healthier. And being a co-op allows its members to, co uh, to, to collaborate and combine their skills and experiences uh, to achieve mutual goals. Their members strive to create an environment that fosters care and support one another and their communities. Uh, so I'm really happy uh, to hear from uh, Estrella and Carmen. So Estrella is a lifelong practicing multidisciplinary Mississauga, Nishnabe, Lubik, Lubik, <laughs> sorry, uh, Estrella, <laughs> uh, how do you <laughs> look Bonin? Look Bonin, uh, um, two spirit artist with a focus on traditional Anishinaabe beadwork, contemporary woodland painting, digital illustration, and mixed media. She has over 15 years of professional work experience as an artist and over 10 years of experience lecturing and teaching Indigenous art and media history. She holds a diploma in First Nation Community Studies at a BA with distinction in Cultural Anthropology and Indigenous Studies, an MA in Indigenous Governance, and is an IGOV PhD candidate working within the fields of curriculum development, arts education, and community-based Indigenous research. Uh, Carmen Wigwas. Craig is Crane Clan from Hiawatha First Nation. Carmen? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, is it Michisagi Nishnabe? Yes. <laughs> Jack and Dodim? I don't know. In race, like uh, what is known today as Ontario. Um, her Nana. Casey Cowie from Hiawatha and her papa was David Craig from Six Mile Cross in Northern Ireland. Carmen is grateful to live on Lake Wayne lands today. 
She is a big sister, auntie, daughter, granddaughter, a niece, partner, cousin, and a friend. Carbon's passions in life are for language and cultural revitalization and resurgence. Access to language and culture for all Indigenous people. Accessible learning and coming together as communities to uplift one another. She holds a BA in linguistics with a focus on Indigenous language revitalization and a Master's of Education in Indigenous Language Revitalization, both from the University of Victoria. So thank you again, and um, I'm excited to hear your presentation. Miigwech. Miigwech. I'm just gonna pull up the slides. And let me know if this is the right one, is it? Okay, cool. Um, so, Ani Buju Kinawia, um, thank you so much, Trista, for introducing Australia. And I um, didn't realize how hard our bios are to read until just now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we are two of the people who make up Odena Urban Indigenous Consulting Cooperative, and we both happen to be Michisagi Nishinaabe from communities just across Rice Lake from each other. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I'm zooming in today from Lekwungen territories, which is known to many people as Victoria, BC. Um, and I'm really grateful to live here. And I'm so grateful that the sun is out today. Um, Australia? Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, I'm um, currently on the territories of the Kwanlin, Dan, and Ta'an peoples in Whitehorse and uh, it looks like it's gonna be a beautiful day and I'm looking forward to hearing so many of the questions that might come up, miigwech. Um, so we consider ourselves a heart-centered community-based worker cooperative and part of that is our name, which is Odena, um, which means in Anishinaabe Moan, it's community or village, um, and it has in there um, a part of it that refers to heart, um, ode. ode. Um, so that's kind of part of how we ended up choosing our name. Um, and as uh, Trista described, we um, offer consulting service in a whole range of areas. Um, I think my favorite is education and curriculum, but I enjoy all of the projects that we engage in. Um, and yeah, we're always excited to learn new things in the work that we do, so. And I also want to acknowledge just before I go on that all of the artwork in the presentations that we have is uh, done by Australia. Um, yeah. Australia? Um, we have a number of different areas of specialization um, that are you know, best suited for our backgrounds and our the types of education that we've um, learned over the years. Uh, we focus on language and cultural resurgence and revitalization, Indigenous governance and leadership, education and accessible learning. This is super important because this is like a really underserviced area um, and making sure that like everybody's included is like such a priority for us. Um, indigenous cultural acumen training and that's for, uh, mainly for <clears throat> settler organizations and settler institutions that are wanting to um, broaden and expand their engagement with Indigenous communities in a meaningful way. Um, child and family welfare consulting, um, as well as uh, decolonization and indigenization um, within education settings. Um, the mission, so we gathered together with, um, so there's a handful of people who aren't yet a part of our cooperative, but are planning to kind of come on board with us. So before we started, we engaged in a pretty big process of coming up with like what our mission and vision and values and all of our policies are. And so what we share today for those um, areas was the result of a long process of collaboration um, between a whole bunch of us. Um, so this is our mission. Um, we collaborate on projects that foster the well-being of our members and uplift our communities 
and our mission is rooted in an indigenous business model that embraces a healthy, supportive, and community-centered approach, breaking free from the confines of systemic norms. And we center individual and community values in all aspects of our work, unlearning detrimental practices from experiences of colonization. Um, we're committed to nurturing a shared vision of health, wellness, and resurgence. We think of ourselves as um, intertwined in relationality, and we really want to consider our impacts in everything that we do. So our vision is um, looking forward to a future where our Indigenous languages and cultures are vibrant and all around us at home, in our communities, and um, at our work, our places of work, too. And so then our approach to all of our projects, um, this is something that we took some time to work together to develop. Uh, it means a lot to all of us that we continue to work in this way with each of the projects that we take on. Um, so it's indigenous led. And that means to us that all that we do is grounded in our community values and belief systems and that the majority of our membership continues to be indigenous. Um, it's community based. Our research and engagement methods, they're community based. So we put the community we're working with first and nothing we do is without ethical considerations for community um, and their needs and wants. And we always recognize that we cannot know for a community. Um, there are guides in any work that we do with them if it's, yeah. Um, and even with our own community, we're a part of that. And so we need to make sure that we're listening um, we also follow an intergenerational approach. So we believe in engaging with, um, we be believe in engaging with, uh, intergenerational knowledge in all the work that we do. And because everyone has something important to contribute and we need to listen to those voices from every generation. We believe in honoring participants, um, in all of our work by creating experiences that recognize everybody as an expert and everyone as a knowledge holder, because every person arrives with something to share. Um, and this for me is particularly relevant when I'm writing curriculum or running learning opportunities. I always want to make sure that we're hearing from what people already know, um, because we can learn a lot together from what the people in the room know, as well as what the people coming to teach know. Um, so we engage with all of our work with this mindset, this principle in mind. Um, and of course we hold space for marginalized voices um, and we consider those in the work that we do. Um, we think that, well, we know that those are often the most important voices to listen to. And we also know that they're often left out. So this is an important um, part of our approach. And then of course, um, as we're both, we're all really passionate about cultural initiatives. So as much as we can, we aim to contribute to our cultural and linguistic resurgence um, in everything that we do. Oops. Um, deciding who to work with. I think this is a really important question um, for anybody that's in consulting, but we found it to be like an, a particularly important question for us. And, the context of being in a cooperative, that's a um, consulting um, based work that we focus on um, because we really wanna prioritize um, like a shared vision, shared values, honesty, integrity, and um, authenticity in our work. So when it comes to contract vetting, um, we wanna have like that, that basis of a shared set of values that with the people that we work with. Um, we want to be considering the potential impacts on community and centering community consultation and community voices. Uh, we want to prioritize having um, an ethical responsibility um, in terms of making sure that we're not going to be engaging in ways that um, would be detrimental to the futures of those communities that we work with. Um, we also put in stuff around um, avoiding uh, conflicting projects because that can happen and you want to make sure that um, you're coming at things from uh, a way where everybody's uh, you know equi equitable 
and um, making sure that there's no uh, power engagement in the kinds of projects that we're choosing and that we're all being uh, honest and um, we'll remove ourselves from working on projects if there is a conflict of interest as well for the betterment of our co-op. Um, we wanted to consider the importance of authenticity. Uh, we joined an organization called uh, ID1N or ID First Nations. Um, they're an organization that verifies connections to Indigenous communities and requires a majority of Indigenous members to be verified. Um, this is something that's really important to us in an era of um, fraudulent identities that are being crafted. Um, it's also in alignment with our membership policies around having a majority of Indigenous members for our cooperative to be running um, efficiently and effectively. Uh, our code of conduct is um, around working together to uphold our shared vision and values. It has an emphasis on communication engagement that centers the heart, honesty, and relationality. And we have a strong foundation that is inclusive, respectful, and culturally grounded in the community. Our membership criteria and admission um, has to do with an alignment with our cooperative values and our ways of, of working. And this is really important because you want to be working together with people as a team where we can communicate well with each other and where we have that level of respect for one another. Um, and Carmen will be talking about this later, but it has to do a little bit around uh, making sure that we are engaging in wellness with each other. Um, and we have a, a congruency with the cooperative's commitment to upholding responsibilities and integrity. Uh, there's more about this on our website, but that's um, a part of our uh, membership policies around uh, making sure that everybody's in alignment with the values that we uphold. Um, so I wanted to, because we underwent a pretty uh, in-depth process of policy development, um, and those are all mostly publicly available on the website, I think um, there might be a couple we left off just because they didn't feel totally relevant to the public, but we wanted to post most of them just for transparency purpose, but also because we're proud of them and we think that other people could benefit from um potentially benefit from using them uh, if they want to. Um, so I thought I would share a few highlights that we're particularly proud of. Um, one of the policies that we developed is an intellectual property policy. Um, and some points in that that are kind of neat, um, well, not neat, they're just important, I think, um, is one around the ownership of intellectual property. So. Australia and I have both done a lot of consulting work in the past. Um, and just speaking from my own experience, I've put a lot of work into a lot of resources that really came from and was, uh, it's just, they were all parts of me. Um, like what I know is a result of so many years of being in community and my family. And I poured a lot of that into a lot of these resources, but I don't actually own any of them because I created them for um, uh, my former employers. Um, so those resources are owned by my former employers or they're owned by jointly by her and by um, the organization that we developed them for. Um, the way that we see it is that unless there is um, a community ethics process where that community requires the ownership of that, resource, for example, if it didn't really come as much from me, but I was just guiding the process, um, and it was primarily community knowledge that was uh, part of building the resource, then that community should maintain their ownership and it should we should respect those community ethics. But in the cases like I was referring to where the materials just, they come from me and my heart and my experiences or other consultants, we want our consultants to maintain that intellectual property and ownership of those resources. So that's become a part of our official policy. Um, so just for an example, if uh, I developed an activity for some, for learning purposes for an organization, they would have the use of that, but I would continue to also have the use of that. Um, and so would Odena. So we have kind of like this 
ability to, for all of us to use it. And I think that that is also good just because like, why are we developing resources and activities and things like that that teach and make change and then we're kind of like keeping them to ourselves or organizations are. I think the more people using them, the better. Um, and then we also have a uh, health and safety policy, uh, which I think that a lot of organizations have, um, but ours promotes holistic thinkings and healthy work, holistic thinking singular <laughs> and healthy work boundaries um, in that we aim to just take care of our whole selves. And we want to make sure that um, the consultants that are working on projects as a part of Odena take time for themselves when they need it. Um, of course, we will complete projects within timelines, but we're here to support each other and make sure that nobody burns out or engages in like a whole bunch of really difficult projects in a row. Like we want to make sure that everybody is well taken care of. Um, and that's like, that includes our whole selves, not just like our physical selves. Um, and then our conflict resolution policy has a really strong emphasis on communication um, and using the process of circles to resolve conflicts. Um, and again, these policies underwent several reviews by other urban indigenous people that we know. Um, so some of the policies that we ended up were, with were the ones that I mentioned, as well as we have a social and environmental policy. Uh, Australia mentioned a contract vetting and ethical evaluation policy. We also have an equal opportunity and non-discrimination policy um, and a handful of more. And you're welcome to check those out on our website, which is odena.com. And this is me again. Um, so in terms of community wellness, I wanted to talk a little bit about the inspiration for Odena. Um, part of starting our cooperative um, was just a result of seeing uh, people not being taken care of in their work, especially in the consulting field. Um, and so we were seeking a business model that would help us to be able to take care of each other by listening to each other. Um, I worked with um, another, a colleague who became pretty unwell um, in the work that we I did at my a former employer. Um, and just the way that things were set up, we weren't able to take care of her. Um, and I think that we're able to do that, or I hope we'll be able to do that. And we're going to try our best to do that at Odena through having a set of good and shared values um, that we stick to. Um, and I think we all, I definitely know that we all have a belief in the wellness of each other. Um, I definitely noticed that sometimes around like National Indigenous Peoples Day, um, sometimes the requirement to do like several back to back blanket exercises in one day uh, was just, it's just not something that you can do. And, but it was an expectation in some workplaces. Um, and I, it's just things like that, that we wouldn't do to each other. Um, and, you know, we would find ways to make to meet our commitments, but I don't think like we definitely wouldn't commit to doing that to any one of us. So that's kind of something that we wanted to mention today. Why the worker cooperative model? Um, we had looked at a number of different models for um, business and um, like sole proprietorship and that kind of thing. And we didn't really feel like that necessarily spoke to like the way of organization that we'd like to be working in. Um, we wanted something that had a consensus seeking approach, um, had collective decision making, had a non hierarchical governance structure. So we were really like, in essence, um, looking to create something healthy through which we could take care of each other. Um, so that's like the wellness piece that Carmen just mentioned, our communities, our languages and our cultures. Um, 
We feel like the cooperative model challenges a lot of the systemic norms um, and power dynamics. Uh, the cooperative model is more than about um, economic growth. It's about community wellness overall. And we've noticed observationally through, um, you know, looking at consultation over the years, oftentimes consulting companies that focus on uh, Indigenous issues are not owned by Indigenous people. Um, and they are often meant to... Um, you know, seek financial gain as uh, central central parts of uh, why they're actually existing because, you know, it's people who are taking government contracts and those kinds of things. And we wanted to go in a completely different direction where we're in a process of, you know, making sure that we have livable wages, but also um, putting our profits um, towards community projects that we support. Yeah, so with that, we had kind of like, the, we started at the social enterprise model as a potential, which I guess Trista recently discovered is actually a cooperative is a social enterprise. Um, so kind of neat that we ended up with it, but just with like a more specific type. Um, but part of the reason we went in that direction was we wanted something where uh, with like the small amount of extra money you get from contracts from the government that you know, we don't need all that money as consultants, we could put it aside and then apply to it to do other projects for the community, um, like urban indigenous moose hide camps or things um, to learn how to tan moose hide or like language camps and stuff like that for youth. Um, and that our cooperative members would then be able to like approve or suggest changes and things like that. Um, I think it works really well or it will work really well within the cooperative model as well. So, yeah. Nahao, miigwech bizindo yeg kinawiya. Our emails are just there if you want to contact us at any point. Uh, I can put them in the chat as well so that when I take the slide down, they'll still be around. So <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Carmen and Estrella. Um, that was amazing to hear. Um, now uh, we are going to open it up for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so if you have any other, if you have any questions, feel free to take yourself off mute and put your camera on. Um, I have a couple uh, questions myself, so uh, I'll just start it off um, as we're waiting for, for more. Um, so besides decision-making power, uh, what is the biggest advantage of being a worker cop versus a single contractor or an employee of a large organization? Do you want to go for it, Australia? Or? You can go first. Okay, I, I personally feel like I, so I worked in, an, I worked in a number of different places um, over the years and when in Indigenous specific uh, roles, I was always isolated um, and I had to make decisions on my own. And I guess that this is the collective decision-making thing, but it was just, it's, I think it's just better, for instance, in the process of starting up a business to have so many minds come together and think about and brainstorm what we want and need and have it not all just come from me or one person. I think that like the top down approach is something that we've seen so much of, especially within um, Western structures of business. And we wanted to do something that was um, more in relation to our cultural backgrounds and our understanding of how we relate to one another um, with, you know, equitable ways of, of engagement, making sure that we have wellness as like a core part of our principles, making sure that our um, values are in alignment with one another. And we really felt like the um, cooperative model um, for worker co-ops had all those elements that we felt really connected to. And, you know, honestly, I didn't really know a lot about cooperatives um, at the beginning, and I found it kind of scary. But um, 
Tristan and Kyle really walked us through all of this in a way that felt so accessible and so welcoming. And we're really thankful for that. Yeah, and I will say um, one of the things that Trista said in our first meeting that really totally put me at ease was that the values of cooperatives, they're there, but it's our own values that we were coming in with that we were, it was okay for us to draw on those as opposed to trying to fit ourselves into the box of what the typical values of a cooperative are. And I was really appreciative of that moment. I was like, I think that that's the moment where I knew that we'd found the right place, especially with cooperatives first as a support system. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and <laughs> uh, the next uh, follow-up question I have is, what was uh, what were the biggest lessons you learned from starting your own co-op? Um, I will say, I think mine revolve around the importance of values alignment when you're working with others. And I think that we don't always get to choose that when we don't start something on our own, but uh, we had an opportunity to do that here. And when we started, uh, we started with a different team than we have now. One person ended up walking away from the table. And that was really hard for us because everybody was so embedded in the process of creating it that it felt really hard to take someone out. Um, uh, it was by their choice that they walked away. Um, and I think it made me realize how important important it was to kind of like not always be so idealistic and to really really think hard about what people's and listen and hear people's values and believe them uh, and not try to like align all the time because sometimes that alignment just isn't there and it won't ever be yeah I agree with all of Carmen's points on that um I was going to answer that too that like that idea of like we you do need to have congruency of your your values and your visions of like what you really want to build together um, because that's really what creates those um, those healthy relationships and maintains those, those healthy relationships in the work that you do because um, if you have constant conflict with one another it um, will be one of those things that affects uh, the work and it affects how you do in community engagement yeah, and I think even if there's not like out loud conflict, it could be just the difference of how you believe or don't believe in what's going on. And that I just that's what we're trying to get away from. We want to really be able to believe in all the work that we're doing and to believe in each other. Um, and yeah, if you're working with somebody who is the type of person who doesn't speak up when something isn't feeling right for them, then you, you it's hard to tell when you're in alignment or not. So you have to kind of listen more deeply. <laughs> Uh, so, in what ways uh, do your members uh, give back or plan to give back to the community? Um, so, I think that that's with our kind of like social enterprise idea, which is we want to, like I said, take excess if there is any from contracts. At this point, we're still kind of building things up, so we haven't been able to do this, but to start to build a fund. Um, that we can apply to for programming that community wants. Um, and obviously we would do wants needs assessments to see if that's in line with what is wanted and needed, um, but also what we're excited to put into action. Um, like I, I teach language and I love to be involved with language. So I'd love to be able to do projects around that. Um, Australia does art, uh, but we also have to check if that's what's something that the community around us needs and wants. Um, but we would, yeah, apply to those that fund to be able to do projects like that um, in the future. Okay, we have a question from Debbie. I'm just wondering, because it seems like you guys are kind of, are you, are you, um, in two different locations or are you guys how close together are you guys residing because i'm just kind of wondering how do you go out and talk to the community or even get your clients base or whatever uh yeah so australia usually is here in lekwungen territories but is visiting up 
in North with our cousin. Um, but I think that if we continue to grow and we want to grow really slowly and intentionally, and we may end up having consultants scattered all around. And I think that that's okay, as long as they are able to do the community engagement in their area, and we can support them to do that. But it's their work in doing that engagement. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then the other question is, um, when you're talking about language base, how would you try to set up a project where you're, like say if I came in and I asked, okay, so how can we actually start making some product for language base? Sorry, I'm not sure I understood. <laughs> It is that I believe that sometimes language language learning tool, sometimes we sit there and we think about going out and teaching the kids, but what if we made language-based toys or something that could actually make them start to learn? And if I came and asked you guys, mm -hmm. how would I do that? Well, what would you be able to do for me in setting that up? I mean, I've... I've been involved in a handful of different projects that I ran on my own. Um, I've got an example. I made magnetic poetry books for Anishinaabe Mwen, Um, And then it comes with a little guidebook that's color coded to the different parts of speech. Um, so I could, I mean, I'd be interested in definitely in supporting language resources. That's one of my favorite things. Um, it's harder, of course, if it's not my language, to actually help with the building, but I can definitely support it for sure. So do you, say if a community came and asked you if they wanted to start making language language tools, would you help them? Like how do you, how would you be able to provide them the help that they need? Like say if they wanted to make books, but it's based on their language, or even if they wanted to tell stories and make it into a book, do you apply for the grant for them or how do you go about that? Yeah, we could support grant writing. I think that it would be best to have community members work on their own language stuff. If they wanted us to help review it or something like that, we could do that. Or um, I, so I helped teach Hulk Klamitnam Immersion Up Island last semester. And I honestly, as a result of that experience, I don't think I would do that again. Um, it's not my language. They needed someone to teach. And so I stepped in because I was asked. Um, but I think, I mean, I know that it needs to be our language speakers that run those classes. Um, yeah, so we would have to figure out like, what are the gaps, but, and where you need support and if we do fit or not, you know? Okay. Um Thanks for the question, Debbie. Um, we have a couple coming in with the chat. Uh, so there's one from Jessica. Can you, uh, can any or all of you talk about how you address settler colonial issues and what anti-colonialism work you do? Australia, I feel um, like I think that falls under our uh, Indigenous acumen training, actually. Um, Carmen's been involved in um, blanket exercises a number of times. Um, I've been involved in that uh, area through policy making um, within institutions around ethics, around ethical engagement specifically to do with research um, with community, because um, there's a propensity for extractive research uh, from settlers going into community, and that's a very long history of that happening. So uh, there's a need for policies and there's a need for there to be boundaries and constraints that are respected and built by community first. Yeah, um, one of the training opportunities that I was involved in that I really, um, I felt was a different approach than I've generally seen to um, teaching settlers about indigenous uh, acumen was um, the program that I had. <laughs> the Victoria Native Friendship Center um, and it is around uh, it's built around indigenous and non-indigenous people working together towards change so the training is for both groups um, and uh, yeah it, 
I really enjoyed building it and I also enjoyed watching it and I've seen a lot of really beautiful relationships form out of that learning program. Um, so I would love to be involved in that type of learning again or that type of curriculum design because it was really fun. Oh, absolutely. And Carmen and I both work um, as educators and do curriculum development. So we do a lot of um, decolonial engagement uh, with uh, settler students too. Um, so we have a question from Andrea. Um, so um, this is, uh, Andrea is curious to learn more about the decolonization and indigenous consulting services. So um, what sort of organizations or projects have you worked with before? So as uh, if you can share any of that. <laughs> I mean, as individuals, Australia and I have worked with a whole bunch of different uh, places, but we're just baby, a baby consultant organization right now. So we haven't done any decolonization projects together yet. Am I right in saying that Australia? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like um, the work that I did at the Friendship Center for me. Um, I have a whole range of services with the British Columbia government, uh, different ministries. Um, Australia and I both teach as sessional lecturers at the University of Victoria. Um, I think both of us enjoy, like we love curriculum design and development. So that is probably where we shine most, but um, uh, yeah, there's, organizational change work that I've done in the past as well. Australia, do you want, I feel like I'm talking too much. Oh, <laughs> um, I started work, actually started out working in indigenization about 20 years ago. Um, that was one of my first research jobs I ever had. And it's been really, really interesting to see how that concept has evolved over time. Um, so in terms of indigenization and uh, decolonization work, um, that's something that both of us encounter quite a bit uh, as Indigenous educators. Um, I think both of us have worked quite a bit in um, post-secondary institutions around that, um, as well as within organizations. Um, I can't name names, obviously, but um, yeah, that's been uh, a core and central part of our work for quite some time. Um, so are you able to share any of the projects you're currently working on? Um, um, I'm trying to think which ones I can talk about. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. I'm working on, a uh, with Dr. Heather Ann Bliss, um, for Lorna Williams on a, research project, a community-based research project on dialect standardization. This is maybe a bit dry, um, but Lorna Williams asked us to look into this because uh, whether we whether we like it or not, communities are always making decisions about Indigenous language standardization and whether we notice it or not even. And so the idea of the research is to just kind of look into what decisions have been made in the past in communities are being made now and what those implications are, how people feel about it, things like that, so that we can share that knowledge out across communities and people can learn from each other. It's just not something we see a lot of writing on right now. So we're in the beginning stages of that and just setting up um, talking circles. So that's one of the... Uh <laughs> um, so Natalie has a question about education and curriculum development and learning materials creation. So if uh, Natalie, if you want to expand on that. Hi, thanks. This is amazing. Um, I'm at, I'm at the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives at the University of Saskatchewan and we just started working with a postdoc in education from Tehran on um, what sort of education curriculum resources there are in high schools about cooperatives. Like I, I know curriculum development about cooperatives may not be part of your purview yet. 
but I'm just wondering, I'd just like to hear more about the sorts of resources that you, you, you know, could develop for classrooms to try and get, um, like, I'm just thinking about the fusion of, of both of these things in what your organization does and being able to translate that into some of, like, we want to tell compelling stories about the power of cooperatives to solve wicked problems and bring people together and care for community. And I'd just like to hear more about those sorts of learning resources that you develop or could develop. Yeah. Krista, <laughs> do you want to speak on this one? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we might, yeah. Or can you speak on this one? For learning? Resources? Well, just that we might be working on a project together in the future. Oh. Um, or is that still? I, I really can't speak on that right now. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. No, I would love, like, I think stories and things like that, bringing those into classrooms are, is a great idea. Um, I didn't actually know. I don't think I learned anything about business at no. all in K-12 to um, or actually in post-secondary. It was that <laughs> all of my learning about business uh, happened over the last couple of years while I was trying to figure out a solution to the problems that we had identified as a group. So um, I think it would be really interesting, uh, especially to kind of like steer people away from the way traditional businesses run and to identify that there is an alternative option. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had um, some interest in uh, community engagement around Indigenous cooperatives already um from a number of different organizations uh so there is an interest there there on our end and there is potential there for um building curriculum around that because we know that there's uh other indigenous people out there that are uh, looking for alternatives to the current kinds of um, business models that are out there mm -hmm. great thank you i might be in touch okay oh awesome <laughs> Um, is there any other questions that we have from the audience? Um, I know there is one um, requesting information from directly from Carmen and Estrella about availability. Uh, we will um, make that introduction. I believe, yeah, Carmen and Estrella both ha uh, have their emails in the chat. So. Uh, if you want to talk about individual projects, please feel free to reach out to them. Um, and if there's no other questions, I just want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, if you have not already joined our Your Way Together Facebook group, so that's our ongoing casual uh, discussion on cooperatives in our community. Uh, so where participation and discussion is encouraged, it's on Facebook, it's Your Way Together. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions or want to discuss a cooperative idea, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, yes, we cooperatives first is on X and LinkedIn, um, and Facebook as well. Uh, Estrella and Carmen, uh, what social media platforms are can people find you on? At this point, we're only on LinkedIn, and they have a wonderful website. So I encourage uh, you guys to go check out their uh, website. So I just want to thank Carmen and Estrella to, for joining us here today. Uh, I love hearing from you guys. Uh, I think what your work is doing and how you are able to combine yourselves into the co-op model and create these business opportunities while supporting communities is amazing. Uh, and thank you for sharing your knowledge here with us today. Um, 
So until next time, uh, Miss Swift, and thank you for coming. Miigwech. Miigwech, we appreciate the opportunity.